Kia ora tato, nā mai hari mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this session. Uh, it's a live session from EHF. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa New Zealand. It's an informal session, but it's an informative session so that you can leave here after 60 minutes and feel that you know the speakers and the content and that on a personal level so that you understand what their intentions are and that you can contact them directly afterwards. So this session we have Tessa and we have, I'm just shifting my screens here, Cheryl and they are going to run through two separate presentations for you and then we're going to jump into some Q&A and hopefully we can just keep the ball rolling and have a really good conversation. So first up Tessa is going to tell us about the Gift Trust and she's also a fellow in cohort seven. But first, I'll just do a quick intro of them both. So Tess, if you just do a quick intro and then I'll go to Cheryl and then you can do a quick one and then we'll go back into presentations. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so kia ora koutou ko Tessa toku ingoa, and I've been the engagement lead for the Gift Trust um, for the past six months. Over to you, Cheryl. Kia ora koutou ko Cheryl Spainaho. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Gift Trust. Um, so the Gift Trust is the umbrella entity that we're talking about today, and we run two different initiatives. Tessa will talk about the Gift Trust, and I'm going to talk about our other um, initiative called the Gift Collective. I've been running the Gift Trust for around about five years, um, and that's me. I live here in Wellington. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Cheryl. Good. Tessa, if you want to share your screen. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm here to talk about the Gift Trust. Uh, our purpose is to simplify generosity to make good happen here in Aotearoa, New Zealand and offshore. Um, we connect donors to charitable organisations making a difference through personalised gift accounts. So it's a bit like having a bank account, um, but instead it's for the purpose of giving to charitable organizations. Um, so today I'm going to provide a brief overview of the Gift Trust. Um, and as Cheryl mentioned, that's sort of the umbrella body that we're talking about today, um, but an initiative and separate um, initiative underneath that is the Gift Collective, which Cheryl as our executive director um, of the Gift Trust will discuss. Ooh. But I thought I'd start um, by kind of taking a step back on why does the charitable sector matter in New Zealand and what impact is the charitable sector actually making? So I think people underestimate sometimes the value that the charitable sector drives here in, in New Zealand in particular. Um, it's nearly 5% of our GDP, um, which largely a, a big chunk of that figure includes our volunteering community, who are making a lot of good happen every day in our communities. Um, and I've kind of identified three key areas that the charitable sector, community sector more broadly, is really effective at delivering. So firstly, a lot of the time government will pass over service delivery to the charitable sector. Um, and this is especially common in the housing sector. And if you go to community housing Aotearoa, you can see all the different kind of housing initiatives um, that sit under that umbrella, bo umbrella body here in New Zealand. Uh, another really niche area that our charitable sector is good at is civic engagement. So we have organizations like Generation Zero and many others that actually advocate to government to create long lasting systems change. And um, Generation Zero I've pulled out there as an example because they were actually the first group responsible for the zero carbon bill that went through um, government a, about a year ago um, and has been a game changer in terms of our climate response as a country. The third really important area is creating community and cohesion. So our charitable sector responds to different interest groups, different community groups, and creates a sense of belonging for many people. So for example, Inside Out is a um, charitable group for the 
LGBTQ community, and they have been recognized for the amazing work they're doing to uh, raise the profile and create a sense of belonging for that community. Also, finally, I thought I'd touch on COVID-19, which is fresh in our minds as we are in the midst of another lockdown here, uh, the, probably the most surprising lockdown for us all. But I find it really interesting that essential services tend to be um, in the charitable realm. So many charities are continuing working um, during this, this outbreak because they're considered essential. And I think that value of the charitable sector really needs to be um, appreciated and recognized. So the pictures here, just for context, are um, a couple of charities that have been part of my personal journey in this sector. Uh, starting off on the top right is Ignite Consultants, which is a university group connecting um, students to community groups in Dunedin and Wellington through eight month projects. And um, that was sort of my first exposure to the sector and it uh, exposed me to Camp Quality, which is a um, children's camp for children living with cancer on the bottom right. And then from there, I've been a trustee for Birthright, which is um, the image on the bottom left, and a trustee for Kaibosh, which is a food rescue charity. And then the logos to the left, I think kind of underpin a lot of um, different organizations I've been a part of, but that kind of the infrastructure to make the charitable sector work. And so here we're talking about the gift trust as a really key piece of the infrastructure in encouraging people to give and um, encouraging therefore the charitable sector to thrive. So how does the Give Trust work? What is the Give Trust? Um, as mentioned, it's a bit like having a bank account, but instead we call it a gift account. Uh, and people can open a gift account through the Gift Trust um, very easily through a form on our website. Accounts start with a minimum of 5,000, um, but you don't need to make donations straight away. You can pause and actually strategize with us on how you want to um, give and what priorities, giving priorities you have. And while you're pausing and considering where to give your funds, um, you can also be, uh, you can also invest that money. So we have um, broadly three different investment options and we um, offer kind of ethical investment options in particular um, to through two different routes and we help connect you to the, that investment um, opportunity. And then finally, you decide when to give and what to give, and we help you with that process. So we provide um, due diligence as a basic step. We check whether the entity that you want to give to is managing their finances properly, and we do all of that kind of administrative background behind the scenes to ensure that donations can go through smoothly. Um, but in addition, and I think the real value, a, a real key value of the Gift Trust is that our team, um, Cheryl in particular, is really connected with the charitable sector. So we can offer strategic guidance on where you might want to give um, and actually help direct your funds into something that can make a huge impact. So this slide just outlines um, the benefits of the gift trust, and these are wide ranging. So something I didn't mention before is that you get tax credits when you give to chari charitable organizations. And the rationale there is um, essentially that charitable groups are kind of often delivering um, equivalent or sometimes even more than what the government can contribute. So you can get your tax credit back from, for that. Um, so we enable and um, support that tax credit process. We also, as mentioned, provide research and we take the guesswork out of giving. So I kind of think that um, sometimes you sort of might walk down the street and see a bucket and pop a dollar in there. And that's actually not the most effective way to give to charities. It's worth taking the time um, to pause and actually be strategic about where you want to invest your money in the charitable sector, similar to the strategic thinking you do with your bank and your um, investment strategies on other funds that you might hold. 
Uh, we provide genuinely impartial advice. So if you're interested in giving to an organization, um, we help you give to that organization. Um, and we essentially provide impartial due diligence um, around that giving. And another um, key benefit, particularly for New Zealanders who are sometimes a bit shyer than other cultures, um, you might not want to blow your own trumpet about your giving. So you can do this um, really anonymously through the gift trust. We hold about 50 gift accounts and quite a few of those gift accounts are completely anonymous. Um, so it means that no one's bugging you about your charitable giving um, and we can help you with that privacy. On the other hand, um, we have a couple of donors who are really uh, outspoken about their giving. And we also, um, if you want to go down that route, we encourage that, um, that ability to be outspoken if you do decide to go down that route instead. So one of our donors who's um, very happy to talk about the gift trust is a EHF, very connected EHF founder, um, Matthew Monaghan, who many of you listening um, probably have heard of or, or might know. Uh, so he's an amazing guy who's um, moved over from the States after a really successful venture um, over there. And he's, he's making a huge difference in particularly the climate change space and environmental space here in New Zealand. Um, this case study on the slide is about what happened during COVID. So the Namaste Foundation that Matthew um, is, is the, in sort of one of the people in charge of, uh, they found during COVID that they wanted to respond and they wanted to respond quickly. So they partnered with the Gift Trust and they set up a fund that we helped manage with them. Um, to distribute money to a range of different organizations that were probably those essential services that I talked about earlier. Um, and we helped connect them to the causes making a difference. So for example, the Namaste um, and featured in this picture has given to lots of different organizations, but in the pictures, the learning environment, which is an educational hub in Whanganui um, and they're doing excellent work in sort of conservation curriculum and mental health and well-being by being educated in the outdoors. So that's hopefully a quick overview of what we do here at the Gift Trust. Uh, I've been um, the engagement lead for six months and strangely have decided um, to move over to the UK in the midst of a COVID lockdown. Um, so if you have any questions, I would suggest getting in touch with Cheryl, who's about to speak, um, and she's our executive director of the Gift Trust. And even if you're just interested in giving and you don't know where to start, um, I'd really vouch for the Gift Trust. It's an amazing team and an amazing platform to support you in a giving journey. Thank you. So just take any questions first. Does anyone have any questions on the Gift Trust before we move to the Gift Collector? I do, if no one else does. Um, so with the uh, tax, because obviously a lot of fellows and a lot of people will be trying to put their money across the border. What country, so I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware of we've got something set up in the US for, for companies to be able to pull their tax across, but what other countries around the world do you have a similar partnership with? And, or is it easy to do it with other countries so that people can get that sort of tax relief? Shall I jump in here, Tessa? Might be easier. Um, so yes, we do have a route. And just for those who don't know, I'll explain the US route. Um, we do have a really great partnership set up in the US with an organization called RSF Social Finance. So they are what's called a donor advised fund in the States, which is essentially the equivalent of what the gift trust is. But we hold um, a fund with them. Any US based donors can give tax effectively into that fund. They get their US tax credit. They give in US dollars. Those funds build up and we bring them over quarterly to New Zealand and distribute them to whatever charitable causes the donors want. So it's a really nice, simple solution. We don't have quite the same setup in any other countries, but we can and do and have brought funds over from 
um, the UK, Australia. We've brought some funds over from Singapore recently. So there are different ways of doing it depending on different jurisdictions. But generally speaking, we would partner with the equivalent of what the gift trust is in that um, in that country, and we can get don oftentimes donors can give to a donor advised fund in their home country to get the tax credit and then request that they make the grant to an international charity, particularly one like the gift trust, which has gone through this process a lot of times. So we have all the due diligence available. So that's quite a nice, neat solution to bring funds from overseas here. On the flip side, I'll just mention, we can also make grants to international charities ourselves from New Zealand, from New Zealand donors. We do have a limit. So we can only give 25% of all of our donations in any one year to international causes, but that's actually quite high because we grant a lot in New Zealand. So um, people can talk to us about making international donations and getting New Zealand tax credits as well. Mm, that's really good. So just Cheryl, just very briefly. So it was RSF, wasn't it? Just to clarify. Yes, yep. that's right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good. Someone asked me about that the other day. So that's good. Thank you. I couldn't remember. I just knew that you'd done that work with um, Jason Franklin to get that set up. Um, are there any other questions from the floor? Otherwise, I have another one. Um, there are 26,000 charities registered. How do you decide when people are coming to you saying, gosh, which ones should I go to? Do you, how do you sort of help people sort of filter through? Do you have it sort of set in clusters or you know what makes it easier for people and how do you make it fair then perhaps that all charities might have a, a, a sort of option? Mm -hmm. um, I'll jump, or do you want to jump in here, Tessa? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll give it a crack and then I'll pass over to you, Cheryl. Um, so we do have a charities register in New Zealand, which lists all of the 27,000 charities. And I guess um, it's a really unwieldy tool to use, but we know how to use it, which is one of the advantages of potentially partnering with us. So we we do, um, if we're carrying out any research, use that tool and make sure that we're giving a fair chance to those 27,000 groups, um, but you can categorize through that tool. Um, and then we also, I guess, have quite a good sense and connections on the ground, but also with other donors to be able to pull out effective charities um, depending on what the request is. So a lot of the time it's that desktop research plus the connections that we already have. Mm, nice. Because I can imagine yeah. some people would have certain criteria that they want, uh, a, um, but they don't want to do that hard yards themselves. Or if they're doing it from afar, they might not understand what that charity is mm. here in New Zealand. And I just add to that, that we work really carefully with each donor to set their strategic um, vision. So it's not a matter of going and looking at 27,000 charities, really. It's actually sitting down with that donor or that company and saying, okay, what, what change do you want to see in the world? Because that's really what charitable giving is about. You know, what is the change that they'd like to see? What is the issues that they're passionate about? We hone it down into categories and groups. And then we do, like Tessa said, the research. But actually getting the first stage done is probably the most important piece because then you know what you're looking for. And we do connect with a lot of other philanthropic donors so we can get intelligence and research on different charitable entities that are doing good work as well. Mm, good point. I love that about, you're right, because people will have areas that they're interested in. So setting the first thing is sitting down and, and deciding and having that strategy and plan with them. Because there's actually now financial advisors out that are focusing purely in this area where they will give you a lifetime sort of plan of being able to give so even if it's only $40 a fortnight out of your pay but they can work that out with your current um, uh, salary your current uh, lifestyle and financial they can actually look to see yeah, how much money you could potentially give for the rest of your life going into um, um, retirement yeah so that you don't actually leave perhaps with a whole lot of money sitting there that could have been given to people in need throughout the whole time so it's really good to see there's a few more of those popping up. I love it. Yeah, and we work with quite a few of those. There's some really interesting ones out there who are focusing on that. I love that too, because mm -hmm. it's something people don't always think about. And, and maybe we should True. reframe how we think about wealth in that way. Like perhaps the idea of leaving when you're gone and leaving all this wealth behind is a bad idea. If you if you decided something interesting to do with it during your lifetime and actually made some good with it. 
maybe we yeah. should think of it in that way. Yeah, because you'd see, then you'd see the benefits of what you're giving and that might give you more, you know, pleasure in, in life too, right? It makes you happy too because you're seeing it being given. So just for those that have joined us, we've just had a presentation from Tessa on the Gift Trust. If you have any questions, feel free to pipe up before we shift to the Gift Collective. No, good. Okay, team. Okay, so yeah, sure, if you take us away on the Gift Collective. Sure. So um, kia ora koutou. For those who joined us a bit late, I'm Cheryl Spain. I am the Executive Director of the Gift Trust. Um, and I'm talking today about our side entity, the Gift Collective, but just um, to give you a brief um, overview of why we decided to do this. The Gift Trust itself has been around for actually around 10 years, and we very much focus, as Tessa said, on um, providing efficiencies in the donation and philanthropy sector. So what we're, what we're about, as well as what Tessa said, is actually helping people to do things really efficiently and with as low cost as possible, but also in a very tailored sort of way. So we work mostly with quite high net worth donors, people that give reasonably large sums to charitable causes. And so we're all about um, making things easy and um, providing that great sort of back end, I suppose, administration and due diligence. And because we've been running this initiative for some time, we get approached on the other side of things, of course, by charitable entities who are interested in receiving funds. And along the way, we started seeing a need really and a niche for, um, there's a lot of new charitable initiatives that are getting set up. There's a lot of wonderful ideas that people have, including people in the EHF community for new amazing projects, which would be charitable. But to get um, to go through all the hoops in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of getting charitable status and allowing donors to get their tax credits when they give to that charitable entity is quite a process. And it's quite a burden for a lot of organizations or just people who are setting up these initiatives if they've never done it before. And so we started having um, conversations. Um, particularly with our partner on this new initiative and we decided I'll tell you about them in a second and we decided basically there was a need in New Zealand for what tends to be called a fiscal host in some places it's called auspicing in some places it's called fund holding but essentially what it is is a place or a home for an entity or an organization to sit under when they are setting up as a new often a new charitable initiative without having to go down that road of setting up as their own registered um, charity. So what the Gift Collective, which is our new entity, provides is basically a home for these initiatives. They sit under our umbrella. They use our charitable status. We obviously have to do all the due diligence and checking because that's quite a high risk thing for us to do to make sure this thing is genuinely charitable. And they basically have um, funds sitting in us. We hold them for them and donors can give to um, the gift collective and they can get their tax receipt, they can get their tax credit and the charitable initiative can get on with what they do best, which is their amazing work. And they don't have to worry about the administration and the compliance. So that in a nutshell is what the gift collective is. But I should say that it's a partnership project and um, I'm actually speaking today really, uh, I shouldn't be here because my our wonderful partner, Alana Irving, who runs the Open Collective and is an EHF fellow, was supposed to do this slot, but she is busy doing much more important work looking after a one and a three-year-old at home, um, so she couldn't make it today. So um, Alana essentially um, talked to us around setting up this partnership. Alana happens to be a trustee of the Gift Trust, so we know her really well, and Alana's day job is running Open Collective New Zealand. So what the Gift Trust and Open Collective have done is we've come together, we've formed this partnership and we've launched this new initiative, the Gift Collective into the world. Open Collective provides the software platform and the tech essentially behind what we do. And the Gift Trust um, provides the charitable umbrella. And so you can see what we've done is we've just smushed our names together and called it the Gift Collective. So I hope I've explained that um, well. It's a little bit confusing. There's lots of words that cross over. I am just going to share my screen quickly, if that's all right, because I would like to show you um, the, uh, the, what a page looks like on the Gift Collective platform. Uh, this is just our, this is our sort of sign up page on 
the gift collective. Um, so people come here, it's all, it's all done online. You can simply click this apply now button and you fill in a very super simple form about what your collective is hoping to do and um, how you're hoping to spend money and you send us some links and we assess it and decide if it can sit under our umbrella. There's various terms and conditions on there. But what I actually wanna show you is a couple of um, live collective pages. So this is one, and these are all publicly um, available. So when an initiative signs up under the gift collective, they get their own page on the site. They can brand this however they like. And they can put their logo on. Um, they can write a little piece about what they do, which you can see down here at the bottom. This is called the Christchurch Initiative. This is an amazing initiative um, following on from the Christchurch terror attacks to um, bring different groups together actually and, and learn from each other, um, different religions and different groups. So what the initiative gets under the gift collective is a page like this. And it's essentially what I like to think of it as it's like having a crowdfunding website. Uh, well, it's like having a crowdfunder, a website and a financial package kind of all in one. So as you scroll down their web page, you can see they've set up these little buttons and they decide what information goes in here. And this allows people to go and make donations to the Christchurch Initiative. They can click on these buttons and make a donation and then they get a tax receipt, which comes from us, but it will say it's for the Christchurch Initiative project. Then as you scroll down, people can be named if they want to donate to this project or they can stay anonymous. So you get a list of all who their contributors are. And then they have a totally public, this is all publicly available information on how the budget is being spent or what, where the donations have been received from. So this is a really new initiative. And so at the moment, they're just receiving donations. They haven't got any expenses on here. I'll show you one that does have expenses shortly. And then there's an about section um, and they have some, some sort of team people at the bottom. So that's an example of a page. I'm gonna show you T.Y. Waka next. Um, which is a Te Ao Māori um, group which is looking at restoring um, the whenua, the land in Aotearoa through traditional um, health and traditional medicine practices. Um, I just wanted to show you their one. Theirs is a little different. They have some donation buttons, but what you can see, interestingly, this is the financial section. And again, you can anonymize parts of this. So if the entity doesn't want sections to be seen by the public, they can. But this basically is an incredible tool that allows TY Waka to track, um, to receive donations. And then all the donors can go in here and see how those donations are spent. So they can actually see what TY Waka is spending all of these things on, what they've been doing. They ran a hui, they put some catering in, um, they had to do some strategic uh, branding for their hui and various other things. So it's a really um, amazing tool just to allow an initiative to share with their donor community what they are spending funds on as well. I'll just stop sharing that page now and come back. Um, so the Gift Collective does allow a sense of transparency. It allows um, charitable initiatives to get up and running quickly, easily. It allows donors to give with confidence because they can see where the money is being spent. Um, and it just allows a simple tool really for, for charitable initiatives to do their good work. We're being very careful, we have to be very careful about it because obviously we don't want to become a sort of pseudo charities regulator um, and that is not what we're designed to do. We're really designed, um, the target I suppose for these types of initiatives is generally speaking newly forming and possibly smaller initiatives because of course when an initiative gets bigger, perhaps it gets staff, um, it's actually able to hold its own, we would envisage that they would probably then set up themselves as their own entity and funds can just be transferred to that initiative. So that's the other beauty of the gift collective is it's not a forever home. It can be a temporary thing as long as wherever we're transferring funds to is in and of itself a charitable entity, we can do that down the track. So it allows total flexibility. Um, we're really excited about it. It's the first kind of its, of its um, kind in New Zealand. And really what's happened in the past for organizations that want to set up like this is they've just had to go around and track down perhaps another charity that may be doing similar things and ask if they could sit under their umbrella and no one has any rules for this type of stuff. So 
we're involved, well, Alana is involved in um, putting together something called a funding white paper, which is really looking at the policy in New Zealand behind all of these things and how best practice works and, and what we should all do. So the gift collective is part of that process as well. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Nice. That was really good, actually. I love seeing all the um, examples that makes it uh, come alive a lot more. Do we have any questions from the floor? Okay. I do. Uh, go, I, go. I kind of want, like, I have no idea and I don't have a charity and I don't plan to have one, but I kind of want to understand that why as a charity. So I have two questions. One, why is a charity I will go through the gift collective and not like a regular fundraising? Uh, if at the end of the day I will supposed to receive the money. Um, and then the other one is like, why as a donor, I will want to do it through that way. And I guess it's about tax, but I would like to have that like clearly. Sure. Yeah. Great question. So from, from the charity's perspective, if let's say you're setting up a charity, Paula, um, and um, what you would want to do if you wanted to receive, to do any form of fundraising, essentially, if you want to do it properly, you really do need to become a registered charity in New Zealand or sit under another registered charities umbrella. And that's because you could go off and do fundraising. Those donors are not going to get any um, tax re relief if you do that, though, if you're just out there fundraising for a project that isn't, um, isn't registered. A, they won't get the tax relief, but also B, a lot of donors don't like to give to a project like that because it doesn't give them a lot of reassurance that there's that it's a legitimate project. Donors are quite savvy these days in New Zealand, and I do find that people are asking that question. Um, you know, you can't just, I mean, that's why we have regulations. You can't just go and set up a charity willy-nilly and decide that it's a charity. So there's a lot of reasons why people do that. But the process to set up as a charity in New Zealand is pretty uh, involved and convoluted and it can take I think at the moment between sort of six to 12 months it depends um, what you do so you have to get a lawyer involved you have to write a constitution that's approved by a lawyer then you have to submit it to the government department which looks after charity regulation DIA um, they'll often have questions and they'll come back and then it gets approved um, and then it's that's within charity services. There's quite a lot of processes to go through. And for some organizations that are volunteer run, they're run on the side, they just don't have the capacity or the time or the knowledge to do that stuff. So that's really why we're offering this service. It's to allow people to set up as a charity legitimately and effectively and know that there's oversight and know that there's an entity that has done all that oversight, but they don't have to do it themselves. So we're just providing that efficiency. And on the donor side, I think donors would like to do it this way because again they just have that reassurance that it's somebody else has looked at it and it's not just some random idea of somebody's that's decided that it's a charity mm. does that yeah. make sense yep good that's great thanks um this is a technical question does it integrate with like accounting packages and other software so that you know so it's all seamless and then also with crms and that so that you can send out to your database if you're a charity yeah and you have asked me the technical question and alana is really the expert on the technical side so i'll do my best um it into well we run all the accounting for all the projects all the projects sit under so we use zero and this package integrates with our zero so all the accounting is essentially done through the gift trust that's one of the beauties of it the project can track their own accounting expenses through the platform it's super easy for them to do and they don't really need to do much else so I haven't yet come across a collective that's set up and then also wants to have their own accounting package. I think they probably wouldn't need it, but I could come back and ask Alana that question. Um, there, there is definitely a way. So in terms of the CRM and communicating with supporters and donors, it has a really nice little mechanism inbuilt where you can send out um, newsletters, you can write little up updates about your project and send them out to all the supporters that have donated to your project so far. So it allows you to do all of that as well. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It has a lot of sort of mechanisms built in. But Alana is the expert on that. Alana's an EHF fellow. So if people have further questions, um, I'm sure she'd be really happy to answer those. Mm, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments or thoughts from anyone in the room? 
Thanks, Cheryl and Tessa. I was just wondering, when you talk about the due diligence process that you go through with charities, are you able to talk a bit more about that sort of in detail and what, and what you look for? Sure. And do you mean on the gift trust and the gift collector side? Should I just cover both? That would be great. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when we're giving out donations from the gift trust, from our donors to charities, it's quite a thorough process because oftentimes they're quite large donations as well. Um, so we're essentially checking, I mean, the, the simple things like, is it a registered charity, for example? Um, and then we're checking things like their finances. Um, we like to check, are they in a, a good financial state? So we're checking things like um, some simple things such as, you know, income versus expenses, how much assets they hold, but we're also looking at things like, are they reliant on one or more sources of funding too much? Are they got a good spread of funding so that they're in a good place? Um, we also check, we're checking for charitable intent, essentially, as the main legal test that we have to do. So is it a genuinely charitable project? All of the other due diligence due diligence steps that we do are really to provide intelligence for the donor. So it's not that we're doing this to kind of trip up the charity or to stop the donation going ahead. It's to provide a really thorough picture. So generally speaking, we're here to, to um, do the wishes of what the donor wants to do. We want to get the funds out to good causes, but sometimes we pick up things in a due diligence process that we like to let the donors about know about and also that we like to let the charities know about. So we've had some really good instances where I've let charities know that they haven't been keeping up with their um, financial, um, they haven't been putting onto the charities regulator the correct new version of their financial accounts and they didn't even know, for example, and then they've been able to go out and get good advice and update it so that other funders can see it. Um, sometimes we've let donors know about particular situations with a charity. There was one example where a charity was in quite basically was in a really difficult situation where they'd lost a key funder um, recently. They were had a dwindling source of funding. The donor still really wanted to support the charity, but what they did was make it um, a matched gift instead. So they encouraged the charity to go out. They increased their donation and they made it a matched gift. And the charity had a really great reason to go out and seek other donors and they suddenly broadened their donor base so it really helped things so there's some things in due diligence we pick up on that helps um, so that's essentially the process on the gift trust side on the gift collective side it's much more lightweight because we're really um, trying to test is this initiative that they want to run charitable and, and there's not a lot of documentation because they're not set up as an entity yet. So it, it's quite a difficult um, task actually to do that. So it involves, there's an application form. It involves more of a question and answer process. So oftentimes we'll have to go back to the organization and find out a bit more detail, but we're basically trying to find out what are the funds going to be used for and um, what are they doing? And, and those two things essentially allow us to, we're using the charity regulator guidance here in New Zealand to test that and to see whether that fits with the charitable criteria here. Yeah. I have a follow-up question, if that's okay. Would you uh, ask, would you consider when you are working with the gift trust, would you consider the uh, uh, charities that are on the gift collective as potential donor receivers? Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of overlap you can imagine because we run both entities. So we have gift trust donors that give to gift collective projects. And of course, that's easy for us to do because the funds are all managed by us. So yeah, that's easy. And I should have said, actually, gift trust donors can give to wider than just um, registered charities or ones that sit in the gift collective. We have in the past given to non-registered charities, so we can, we have to do a bit of extra due diligence, we can give to social enterprises on occasion. Um, we've even, I mean, there are a number of different legal structures in New Zealand, and it's a bit of a grey area, but we have um, given to companies that have a charitable constitution, of which there are a few, um, and Spiral Network is one of those. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of those sort of entities which we can dig deeper into. And there's also incorporated societies in New Zealand, which is a whole different legal structure, um, which we can generally speaking give to those. Some of those are not charitable registered charities as well. So there's a little, there's quite a few legal complications. And Tessa knows all about these, having worked in the legal charity space as well. That's great. So in that way, Basically, if I'm a charity that is not registered and I do choose the gift collective, 
not only for the, all the benefits that you mentioned before, but it's also because you already have like a pool of donors that you can kind of like showcase and marketing saying, if you're interested in this space, let's say education, well-being or something, this other charity that is not in this massive list of all of the charities in New Zealand, you can think of that. So it's like a great, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a side benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Janine, you got a question? Yes, um, I know for charities there is this um, there is a lot of ongoing reporting requirements. But if you're registered on the the gift collective, presumably those are less onerous and um, more designed by yourself. What's what's the difference? Um, oh. Well, we I, is, I think, yeah, I think one of the main advantages of, of doing a gift collective is the lack of, you know, the the, um, the difference in both the application procedure and the ongoing um, reporting. And I just wondered whether you could give us a, uh, an inkling of the, uh, the degree of that difference. Yes, great question. Thanks, Janine. Um, so, yes, that is the, a huge difference. Essentially, we do all the report. We do the compliance reporting to the charity regulator. Um, as the gift trust. So collectives don't do any reporting to the charity regulator at all. They're only um, responsible to us, um, basically. And what we, the due diligence that we're doing is an ongoing process. So what we do is we do the upfront due diligence I mentioned, which is during their application to check what their goals, wishes and aspirations are as an organisation. But then for every single expense that we pay out so you can imagine they're receiving donations all the time we hold them and they sit in their fund and then whenever they want to draw down those donations they basically post onto the site their invoice or their receipt for whatever that expense is and we pay the expenses out but we have to check each of those so it's quite it is quite admin intensive um, because we need to make sure that any expenses we're paying are genuinely charitable so it's an ongoing due diligence process we're doing to check that those expenses are charitable and if anything pops up that we think there is an issue with we just um, discuss it immediately at the time with the charitable entity so there is no um, there's no annual reporting to charities regulator or anything as a registered charity on the other hand um, you have to do your annual accounts we just did ours um so i know the process back to front so you do all your annual accounts you upload them to the charities regulator you have to answer a number of questions you have to have a board of trustees um legally appointed trustees have to meet a certain number of times a year there's a whole process that you have to go through as a registered charity but because we're already doing that that's that's what we do so we wanted to be able to share that with others Great, thanks, Cheryl. Good question, Janine. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments you know wants to make? Or any points that we haven't raised yet? Uh, regarding the meeting, please. Will there be another meeting um, about this topic? Or is this the only? Um, we can have, uh, Tessa and Cheryl can, um, hold other meetings, I'm sure, at some particular point. If you want to get in touch with them, Ellie, and we'll also uh, share the recording. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular question or thought that you wanted to bring up? Oh, no, everything's clear, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just conscious time has flown by. If we don't have any other questions or comments, I'll let you both just have your a last parting comment that you want to leave the audience with for today. So we'll start with um, Tessa, how about you? Yeah, sure. Oh, well, thank you. I, I know I've talked with Sarah before and I know many of you are probably involved in really interesting initiatives um, or you might be, if you're listening in, you might be interested in, in giving and thinking about starting off that journey. And so I just encourage you to think of the gift trust as an option. Um, it's not necessarily the option for everyone. Um, setting up um, your own philanthropic trust can be a good option for um, really, really large amounts of giving. Um, but I would encourage you to just get in touch with um, with Cheryl and look at this as an option. And um, yeah, more broadly to 
ensure that New Zealand's charitable sector can thrive just being part of that sector in, in some way or another is a good thing. I agree. Thanks, Tessa. Cheryl. Oh, thank you for having us. Um, we've been long-term friends of the EHF network, really. I would describe the gift trust as, so it's nice to actually do this session finally. So, um, And we know so many people in the network. Um, so I suppose I would just finish by saying, do spread the word. You know, I guess what I'm really passionate about is that charities should be out there doing the amazing work that they do and and making the changes to society that we so desperately need and there are so many inefficiencies in organizations having to do some of the back-end administration compliance um, and also likewise donors um, you know for them same thing you know setting up their own charitable entity and getting paying for lawyers and accountants and all of that stuff it all seems so inefficient so we're just on a mission really to try and um, help with, with all of those things um, our, we're a, a small but mighty team and we're very keen to kind of help help um, organizations get over those hurdles um, so please spread the word and get in touch and we're always happy to have a chat conversation with people uh, likewise Alana um, Irving who's in the EHF network is also um, available for chats as well mm. thank you Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Tessa. Um, great conversation and lots of takeaways today. Key things for me was, yes, financial planning of being able to give for the rest of your life is actually a thing, and, and it's it's a great, and um, there's no excuse not to be able to give, even if it's only like $10, $1, whatever, you can actually do that out of your pay pack uh, fortnightly, monthly, however, um, you, you get your income, and that there is just so many different choices of charities and people to give to, and you can actually have um, a good strategy lined up for you at the beginning, which I think is great, so that uh, the people who are working in behind can actually know how to spend your money on your behalf, which I think is good. So you don't actually have to do all the hard work. And also about the tax relief. So anywhere in the world that we learn today, so it's not a hard thing and there's no excuse to have to give. And in these times, I actually think it's, yeah, it's good. It's good to bring it to the fore so that the charities can continue doing the work that they do and all the back end stuff is done for them. So they're not having to spend all the time doing the fundraising and trying to find out where their next dollar is coming from. So thank you both for your time. And I hopefully this reaches a lot of the fellows going forward. Tēnā Have a great day.